Hey there, welcome to today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. Today we are joined again by Joel Chan, who is an assistant professor at the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies, or iSchool, and Human Computer Interaction Lab. Previously, he was a postdoctoral research fellow and project scientist at the Human Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University and received his PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. You can find a link to Joel's previous talk with us below. And today he will be talking about accelerating scientific discovery by lowering barriers to user-generated synthesis of scientific literature, which will include discussing how scholarly practices could be transformed. So Joel, I will let you take it from here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm excited to share um, an update on uh, what I talked about in the previous talk, which was linked in the chat. Um, and so let's jump right in. The focus of this talk is on synthesis. Um, and so I thought we could start by uh, talking about what I mean by that. Um, my goal is to remove barriers to effective synthesis so any scientist can ask better questions faster. And so what I mean by synthesis, uh, it's probably an intuitive concept, uh, but some examples include theories, models, design spaces uh, and very good uh, systematic or literature reviews. And the key intuition is that you create a new innovative conceptual whole uh, that's greater than the sum of the parts of things that you're integrating. Uh, so you wouldn't just be surveying and saying, here's a bunch of literature, but you'd be sort of like giving insight into, here are some of the gaps, here are where we should be going next, um, driving uh, progress forward. So one concrete example of this uh, led to a Nobel Prize. Uh, this is Astrid Duplo, um, a recent Nobel Prize winner uh, who credited some of her uh, key inspirations to a masterful survey of the literature in a handbook chapter um, of economic, developmental economics uh, that really laid out uh, some key problems in the field that she was able to sort of connect with her expertise uh, in experimental methods. Uh, so synthesis is super important. Um, if we ignore it, um, we risk wasting our time on questions that are trivial, uh, impossible, uh, misframed. Uh, one of my favorite phrases is, you can't play 20 questions with nature and win. In fact, there's a delightful paper uh, that recently talked about uh, how to play 20 questions with nature and lose uh, in the kind of area of brain training research where uh, they lack this kind of synthesis, this theory of what's actually going on and just had a bunch of experiments. One of the key things that I'm interested in is this problem that synthesis is actually really hard. Um, not sure how much this resonates with your own experience, but this definitely resonates with mine and lots of people that I've talked to. Um, one concrete example is systematic reviews, which are really important. Um, and they're really, really difficult to do. They take a long time to pull off and they're often not updated um, because it's difficult. Um, and so often they're out of date pretty quickly. Um, after they're published. Um, I think of this as a lower bound on how difficult it is to do synthesis, uh, in part because systematic reviews are very uh, singular focus on a single question, usually a single relationship, whereas often you need to synthesize uh, across multiple disciplines, uh, or across different kinds of evidence at least, and you can't so cleanly um, focus on just a single dimension. However, right, so just to give another like metaphor here, um, studying an ethnography of medical systematic reviews. Um, this uh, Bakari paper uh, talked about this metaphor of feeding enslaved to the trap data. You have this, this sense that um, of fighting against uh, the infrastructure. It's not getting any easier. Um, the growing burden of knowledge is making this harder. And especially as we face problems that perhaps will always uh, interdisciplinary required as to converge and uh, integrate ideas across multiple fields of knowledge. Um, this is pretty pressing. So pretty, pretty big need. The core conjecture of this line of work is that it's not just about the tools. It's not just about our motivation. It's about the infrastructure. It's about the unit of analysis, right? Why, why does Google Scholar work that way? Why is it indexing papers? Why is it, um, what is the data structure that's operating on? That's that's my focus. Think about this. Um, you know, when you go search for for papers, um, you're looking for papers, but really, what you care about is what's in them. 
the ideas, the claims, the arguments, the theories, the findings, and the discourse relations between them, right? Support, opposition, repetition, lines of evidence, lines of contradiction, right? These kinds of things are what you actually care about. Instead, you get documents, metadata, and article types, right? So a concrete example of this, if you're interested in uh, whether bans are an effective um, intervention for hate speech, you key that into Go Scholar, and what you get back is a bunch of papers, many of whom, well, some will be relevant. Uh, they're all pretty much going to be in the same topic area, but I'm going to ask, answer your question about uh, what's the evidence for this particular class of intervention in the setting that I care about. Uh, theories, evidence, problem, solutions, they're not first class citizens. Same thing in uh, other tools like Semantic Scholar. Um, I should say it's not their fault, okay? The, these, these indexing systems work with what they have. The data structure is what's at issue. Similarly, um, we have entire industry of system review tools and processes that are essentially dedicated to working against the underlying data structure. They are sort of like, we've got these papers and we need to work our way around it. And so we have all these processes for screening, for data extraction to get to the thing we actually care about. And then we don't share it with anybody else. And everybody has to start from scratch the next time around. Uh, this is a slightly cheeky meme uh, about how uh, this kind of systematic reviews are sort of a band-aid on top of a, to me, fundamentally broken scholarly communication infrastructure that doesn't allow us to ask the questions that we want. So I think it's pretty important. Uh, I see connections between this in terms of, uh, I think it's an underexplored, underappreciated uh, potential mechanism for um, what people are perceiving as a slowdown um, in scientific productivity and progress. Um, it's getting harder and harder to uh, to win a Nobel Prize. Now you gotta sort of spend a longer time to kind of grok the field. Um, we're doing more of our high impact science and teams, uh, which brings its own challenges and overhead. And uh, we have this uh, somewhat controversial, but um, to me, pretty concrete um, observations of um, some slowdowns um, in the impact on, on research. So the core question is how to accelerate scientific discovery by lowering barriers to synthesis. Um, today, I want to talk to you about um, discourse graphs. Um, what are they? Why do we think that they're interesting? Um, why is it hard? Why don't we have them? Uh, this is core idea about authorship bottleneck. And I want to spend most of our time uh, talking about this solution path of scholar power contributions as a sustainable authorship model. Okay. So first, discourse graphs, what are they? So comparing to what we had before, where we're looking for bans and hate speech uh, literature, um, something like this is actually what we're, we're trying to construct or look for, right? We have a question, are bans an effective way to mitigate antisocial behavior in online forums? We have claims, um, which are answers to that question, right? Could be banning as a strategy um, is effective, uh, banning strategy cannot, play, cannot scale. Um, and then we have underneath that evidence, right? Particular results that are supporting or opposing um, these claims. Okay, this, this is a pretty intuitive uh, model. We think about how people talk about and evaluate papers too. They'll sometimes complain, uh, this paper makes claims that are not supported by its data, right? Or we talk about theorizing from data. This is kind of core distinction between claims and evidence. Um, this is not an invention of mine. Uh, this has been talked about for a long time, um, you know, decades, right? We've got a kind of decades of uh, literature on standards for how do we actually formally represent um, a discourse graph. Um, we have the Scholonto ontology was based on claims. We have micro publications, we have CPO, um, we have a bunch of these um, very mature, well thought out, uh, clever standards for essentially how do we represent a discourse graph. Give you a little bit more intuition about why uh, discourse graphs are a good idea beyond just um, the match on the surface with the kinds of questions we're trying to ask. Um, I like to think about it in terms of three C's, compression, contextualizability, and composability. So compression is the first one that we were talking about, where we actually want to find and manipulate compressed units like claims not just whole papers, right? Papers contain lots of different things in them, but we actually care about manipulating and thinking about the underlying um, ideas, right? So 
Uh, we've got these models of scholarly argumentation, but also in creativity with literature. Um, if you break things down, um, that enables you to more creatively recombine them into new uh, theories and models and, and concepts. Contextualizability is super important, right? This distinction between uh, claims and evidence uh, turns out to be pretty important, right? To really understand the scope of a claim, uh, be able to question it, be able to repurpose it. Um, it's really important to dig into, right? If you have a claim that most private annotations are useful to other people, you want to know uh, how it's most measured, what kind of annotations, in what setting, to really understand what this means for, uh, say, some question you're interested in. Same thing on the band side, right? It really matters, but that, for example, to distinguish sometimes between different subreddits that have different subcultures or different platforms or um, different kinds of behaviors and interventions and, and so on. The devil or diamond is in the details, right? Um, we have lots of recent examples of you know the importance of context where we really care about unbundling, for example, children into different uh, age bands. It turns out uh, infants' risks are quite different from uh, young kids, which is different from teenagers, and many studies that don't distinguish those, uh, we lose resolution and ability to synthesize. There's a really fun uh, Twitter account called Just Says in Mice that kind of uh, riffs on this, where a lot of uh, medical studies are reported on and talked about um, without the context that this was a mouse model, right? And they'll say like this implies X for, for people, but actually the context is, is lost. This really impairs our ability to synthesize. So we need access to that uh, easily. Okay. Um, we see this actually in uh, user behavior as well. Scholars will constantly reread during a literature review. They'll, they'll return to, to papers. Um, this is repeated also in studies of general sense making where you got to keep the, the data the information around. Um, and in studies of computer supported cooperative work, where we have these uh, kind of knowledge management infrastructures, um, it's really important to retain the context of, of how a thing was produced, how a piece of information was produced by whom, and so on. One fun uh, desire path that inspires this work is, um, you know, people repurposing tools for uh, different functions. So qualitative video analysis software is meant for things like thematic analysis and interview analysis. But we actually see uh, scholars, a good amount of them actually repurposing it to do literature reviews because it supports the ability to do this dialogue between claims and evidence, between the theory and the data, uh, which is really interesting. Um, this, this core distinction between uh, claims and evidence um, seems really important. And lastly, composability. Um, we get some of this from, from, from LD. If you have these units, but you also have uh, connections between them, you can construct uh, more interesting representations that help you reason about things like tables or causal graphs or arguments and timings. Something like this. So as I mentioned, this is, these are not new ideas. I'm not the first by far to talk about this. There's a pretty large literature and body of work uh, building out these technical standards and infrastructures. We basically have most of the warehouses get built, but it's still mostly empty. Uh, in the bottom right, I'm not sure if you get the reference to that, but the field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. Um, we have some of these people talking about uh, the, you know, we want to have an ocean of these micro publications, uh, these discussed graphs. At the moment, it's no more than a puddle. Um, and this is this has been repeated uh, across a lot of uh, a lot of different platforms. This is a key bottleneck. I call this the an authorship bottleneck. Um, we have a different models for authorship uh, that don't seem to be quite enough on their own. Uh, one of the most popular ones is a specialized curator model. We basically pay people or ask people to volunteer to do this extra work on top of the literature. You can think of systematic reviews as one instance of that, where they take in the, the dirty data, right? And then they kind of add structure to it. Um, this turns out to be very difficult to sustain. This is an extra piece of work that people don't want to do. Um, one very sad recent example is this Mark to Cure effort uh, that was uh, curating literature for uh, NGLY1 deficiency. Um, and they had to shudder because they ran out of funding, essentially. They couldn't sustain. Um, some examples um, of platforms like Research Objects Hub or Nano Publications, um, the number of active users is actually very, very small. So we need something more. Uh, some people think that we can do this uh, in a completely automated fashion with text mining. Uh, this happens to be partially in my field. 
Um, it's very cheap, but it's significant accuracy and transparency challenges. Um, extractive summaries of research papers is very hard, still a very open problem. Um, and you know, some of the promising approaches that people are exploring today with uh, language models, um, we have some pretty significant uh, challenges in terms of accuracy and transparency. So I'm not optimistic that either of these are going to solve the problem on their own. So what I want to do is extend the space of possible contributions to look at this thing that we haven't explored yet, which is uh, what I call scholar product contributions. Intuition, um, and inspiration for the design patterns is some previous work that I've done where um, if you think about a um, collective brainstorming effort, right, where we have lots of lots of different people producing ideas, sometimes it's useful to really understand like how the ideas relate to each other, how they cluster. Um, in the field of crowdsourcing, we have these um, judgments that will have people do. They'll look at these like three things and say which ones are related. So, again, similar to what we're seeing in scholarly domain, it's very tedious. People don't like to do it. Um, it's, it's annoying. However, one insight that we saw is that people naturally cluster ideas when you give them a digital whiteboard. And this means something. The ideas cluster together and there's some meaningful relationship between them. And we can exploit this. Uh, we can integrate the usually tedious semantic judgment work into this intrinsically morning activity and then construct things like an idea map that helps coordinate efforts, uh, deliver more interesting inspirations with basically no extra work, right? You're integrating to the work that people are already doing. That's one of the things that we're not exploring enough yet. And I want to explore more. Okay. So specifically, I'm interested in exploring how we can integrate scholar power contributions of discourse graphs into individual and collaborative synthesis practices. Right. If you think about it, people read lots of papers, lots and lots of papers. Right. Uh, just a, some some rough estimates, but on the envelope, um, you know multiplying the number of uh, faculty by the number of self-reported uh, number of papers read per year. We're in the ballpark of about, you know, 100 million uh, papers read per year. Compare that to the size of literature is pretty big if you look at it by itself, but it's around the same order of magnitude, right? So this is, I think, an interesting uh, source of untapped creative insource. People are already doing all this work. We're wasting it. What if we could, you know, integrate into that work? It's also a little bit more feasible to me. Uh, there's lots of really strong uh, efforts and very smart people working on uh, this problem of changing the way that people publish work to begin with, which I think is super valuable, but extremely hard. It's really entrenched in incentives. Uh, so I'm a little bit nervous about going into that, that area. I'll leave it to uh, people smarter than me um, and exploring complementary paths. Okay. So that's all, uh, you know, we talked about uh, what discourse graphs are, gives you an intuition for why they might be important, why um, we don't have them yet. Um, so now I want to talk to you about how we could have them, right? This, what does this mean, the scholar power contributions, right? <clears throat> the basic idea is we give people tools to build personal discourse graphs for themselves or for their labs. We give them the means to share and federate this discourse graph with others. And then over time, we can layer protocols on top of this to start to aggregate these into decentralized comments of discourse graphs. And that's the roadmap. So there's two questions here. The first is, um, we started to touch on this, right? Is this even a thing that people are doing that we could integrate into, right? Are there integration points for offering discourse graphs? And second question is a so, so technical one, right? Is it actually possible to build tools that can help people build discourse graphs that are shareable. I'm going to focus mostly on the second one. So I'll move a little bit quickly through the first one just to give a proof of concept, right? So the first question is about integration points for offering discourse graphs, right? Um, we've done a fair amount of user research, participant observation, uh, need finding to really understand there's actually a lot of opportunity here. We've put GoPros on people's heads while they do lit reviews. Uh, we've done interviews with people, we've done participant observation in communities of hackers and users of tools of thought. And um, we're, we've been kind of looking for uh, where are scholars already creating artifacts that have properties of compression, contextualizability, and our composability, right? The things that discourse graphs um, provide. 
what we find is that there are integration points in a range of behaviors and tools, um, all the way from people using really specialized tools to just people using everyday tools like Tandem Beaver, uh, which is really interesting, right? So uh, on the low end of the spectrum in terms of like technical sophistication, or I guess not technical, um, uh, <laughs> newfangledness, uh, we have traditional tools that are used really well by what we call virtuosos, right? Uh, so you have things like color coding your annotations when you're reading, right? They mean something, right? You're trying to distinguish. You're not just trying to you know, highlight things, but you're trying to distinguish between, uh, you know, things like in blue would be like a claim, right? And in green would be like a piece of context, for example. Um, you know, writing things in structured ways in Word documents and Google Docs, right? They'll talk about you know, templates. They'll have like, here's the overview. Here are the arguments. Here's the evidence, right? Here's the key takeaway. Um, there's these structured things that people already do. Um, there are also other tools that are slightly more specialized that are mainstream, like uh, we call them explorers, using tools like liquid text that allows you to pull out these excerpts and then create um, structured links between the items. So we have this compression, pulling out these pieces, and then uh, composability, having these edges between them. And then contextualizability, you can jump back to annotations. Uh, I told you about repurposing qualitative data analysis software. That's another example, right? <clears throat> and also adoption of like tools, like uh, new tools for thought, like um, Rome research or Obsidian or Oxy and so on. <clears throat> we also have a lot of hackers who create homes fun system enhancement and whole systems to enable these features. Um, the Orgmo Emacs community has uh, created a open source port of uh, Rome research, this idea of backlinks uh, into Emacs, for example. Um, we have, you know, it looks like this. You can sort of integrate uh, annotation features also into essentially a terminal. Uh, we also have people building on top of tools like Zotero to enable you to uh, enhance contextualizability of your notes, right? You can extract annotations in a way that allows you to jump back to the source of the PDF. Just very briefly, right? Um, we, we see across all of these settings that scholars in their everyday practice, without anybody telling them to do it, already create artifacts with key properties of compression, contextualized grading, composability. So it's promising. It's not enough, though, right? We have this problem of private public alignment. Well, personal notes are contextual, they're idiosyncratic, uh, they're informal, they lack structure. What we want is something that's general shareable that has some level of standardization and reliable capture. How do we bridge this? Is it possible? Right? Is it even possible to tap some of this creative exhaust? So that's research question too, right? Is it social technically possible to integrate authoring of shareable discourse graphs? So at this point, I'm going to pause while I pull up the demo. Here's a walkthrough of um, a discourse graph tool um, in the software Rome Research. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, uh, what you basically need to know is it's kind of like a document, uh, like a giant Google Drive folder, um, but you have the ability to create outlines and you can create links between documents. Um, and what's useful for us is that you see these like bullet structures and links um, are actually um, in the data structure underneath uh, the documents that we can parse. So, but you don't need to know that, right? So just looking at this right now, uh, you can imagine uh, in the context of a uh, research project, you might have um, a single document with a bunch of sources, right, that you're interested in. So for instance, if you're interested in the susceptibility of children to COVID-19 infection, um, you might have a bunch of studies that you want to read, right? So. This looks very similar to an annotated bibliography or list of papers to read. Um, you know, each of these uh, things here, right, is a uh, is a paper. So if you look here, for example, you can see we've got metadata. This is a paper. The key uh, thing that the discourse graph extension allows us to do is to integrate into what people are already doing in terms of, say, taking structured notes on papers. For instance, uh, you can see here, this is a paper, uh, it's a meta-analysis of uh, previous household studies. And you can see here, looks pretty similar to how you might take these structured notes as we saw in a Word document, right? You have thinking about the aims of the paper, 
methods, what they do. You can drop in screenshots, uh, figures to um, to keep the context, right? Um, we have definition of index cases. Uh, and then we have like, you know, the results and contributions, right? What are the key takeaways? Uh, so for instance, you can say here, one main result is if you meta do a meta-analysis of these 11 studies, then you get an estimate of uh, lower susceptibility for children versus adults, right? Um, and specifically, you can see um, the relative risk ratios here. Uh, this, is be this is not too different from what you would see. Um, what we have here is uh, the ability to mark this result as a discourse node of type evidence just by uh, a, a manner that looks like uh, annotation, right? So you can highlight this, hit a hotkey, and you say, this is now a piece of evidence. Okay. And then it shows up in the sidebar. This tells us that it's now a document by itself that we can reference and search for elsewhere. Okay, so that's the, that's the UX, right? So we don't have to do it from the start. We can write informally. And then as we think, okay, this is the key takeaway. I want to remember this for later. I mark it. This is now a piece of evidence. If I want to, and uh, I'll often do this in my own work um, as needed. If I want to keep the details handy, I could, for instance, just drag this and put this in here. So it's just right there, right? I could also copy over in the Rome sense, um, the key contextual details of the study. So it's all in one place, right? This compact micro publication has everything that we need to make sense of it and use it in a synthesis. It's got the summary, it's got the methods that produced it. If I want to dig into that later, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. So that's node creation and annotation. Now let's talk about how do we create edges between a discourse graph, right? The discourse graph have nodes and has edges. The edges are part of the, it's one of the more annoying things to do um, without formality. So let's go and see inside here what this might look like. So inside this document, we have sources, but we also have a space to write in outline. So what I want you to notice here is right here. Let me zoom in a little bit. All right, we talked about this first uh, claim that children are equally susceptible. This is a reference to a claim, right? I've marked this as a thing that I want to remember. This is a type claim. And then I've indented underneath here some results, right? So yeah, this one, this is the evidence. This is an evidence. This is an evidence, yeah? And I've written down here, following is the case for this claim. Right, I've marked this as a support relationship. With this, right, if we go inside here, right, we can see, right, as you saw before, it's got all this data in here. But additionally, we also have this course context, right? We have this relationship now that it supports this claim. Why? How do we know that? Because we said so. We set this here. And so um, we have this information now. And if we jump into this claim, the reverse is also true, right? We know all of the uh, papers that support, all the pieces of evidence that support this claim, right? This is what we just saw. That is part of what makes it formal in the sense like, uh, you know, you might specify this informally in an outline, but you can't query it. Right? We need the, the reverse, right? We need to know that uh, evidence in, uh, supports a claim and also the claim is supported by evidence so we can query it from either direction, right? And it's queryable. So this essentially makes the relationships real, right? So what the plugin is doing is it's recognizing these relationships and essentially making them real, right? We now have this evidence supports claim, evidence supports claim, same thing here. We have another claim here, we have these supports, and we have actually a surprising amount of evidence, um, which um, I'm still digesting. Okay, that's edge creation is outlining, right? So creating the just the edges between the discourse graph. No, it is not an extra task, but it is integrated into uh, my desire to structure my thinking here. All right? So I'm, as I outline it, I create that structure. What does this buy me, right? So now that the nodes are real and the edges are are, are real, let me give you. Uh, a couple of intrinsic benefits, right? So beyond, I just want to do this anyway to structure my thinking, 
right? So if we have, um, whoops, if we have um, the nodes and the edges and we know what the type of relationships are, we can do some computations. For example, we can see uh, the number of discourse relations that a uh, claim participates in, right? So here we can see it's supported by these guys, right? You can get a feel for roughly how much we've thought through uh, a particular idea, right? So if I reference this in an outline, this claim um, has four discourse relations. This claim has 15 discourse relations. Uh, I might want to, you know, look more into this one, for example, if there's, um, you know, not, not enough evidence. If I want to kind of really weigh those, right? Same thing about my hypothesis here. I can keep track of the fact that it's the hypothesis that I've got one piece of evidence maybe that's uh, that's supporting this. Actually, I'm not. Right? There's no evidence behind this, um, so I might want to sort of look into this more. That I can do with uh, structured querying, right? So if we know what the nodes are, we know what the edges are. We can also uh, query um, over the nodes, and we can maybe create attributes for them if we want to. Right. So, for instance, if you wanted to look over the evidence base and say, OK, well, you know, uh, maybe we have this evidence for lowest susceptibility because there's something going on with the testing, the under testing the kids. Right. We can now more focus in a focus way. We can, you know, more focus way go over uh, the pieces of evidence to say, pull out, you know, which of these results were from what kind of testing. Right. Are they all, um, you know, Symptomatic testing, or they some of them, uh, you know, exhaustive. They can filter for the ones that are um, exhaustive and see what the result is. For example, that's just a quick overview, right, of the of the prototype. Right, this is what we can do. We can uh, we can incrementally formalize, integrate the work of creating nodes and edges into um, our normal note taking workflow and writing workflows, and we get some immediate benefits back. Um, we can also export. To this cross graph. So let me stop. Uh, let me now switch back. There's a few things that make this work, right? So we talked about this idea of incremental formalization, where um, this targets a key long standing bottleneck in sort of integrating structure into this uh, early stage creative knowledge work like literature reviewing and thinking, right? Now, this is a pretty old problem uh, since as early as the 80s, uh, people have identified this, right? Um, this uh, work of uh, this system of issue-based information systems is pretty uh, uh, pretty famous um, back in the 80s for structured thinking over design. And even there, we have this uh, observation that you know the early phase of consideration of writing is uh, needs to proceed in very contradictory and incomplete forms. And if you force people to only think in terms of uh, structured nodes and edges, for example, it sort of kills the thinking process. Right, and so they talked about uh, providing tools to aid in the structuring of raw materials, where we don't have to organize them in the beginning, but we sort of graduate that, and that's kind of what we're we're going for here, um, to enable people to write uh, informally at first in unstructured ways, and then add structure as it's useful. So this is accomplished with, like we said, node creation as annotation. Right, we we create nodes as we as we as we need them, as we're ready for them. And we create edges not by typing out properties uh, necessarily, but by um, integrating that into our writing and outlining work, where we have this immediately useful notes with implicit discourse structure that the plugin parses into a usable, shareable, explicit discourse file, uh, which I didn't show you, but you can export actually as CSV, as JSON, um, as Markdown. Um, we have this structure that's preserved. Right? And then we also provide immediate intrinsic benefits. We have structured querying, we have talkback uh, in terms of the level of development of particular ideas um, and exploring uh, your notes in a more systematic way. This is a screenshot of what I wanted to show you, which is you can export this into open standards compliant things like Neo4j uh, version of the nodes and edges. Okay. So technically speaking, all you need is three ingredients. You need a convention for note writing, which people are actually pretty open to adopting. And actually most people already do something like this. Um, we need something like a hypertext notebook that allows understanding of links between things, of which there are many. This is Rome research. Uh, we have Obsidian, we have Notion, we have Tinderbox, we have Emacs, we have 
Athens, Loxy, Chrome, Remnote, lots and lots of different tools can implement this kind of protocol. And then a simple plugin that uh, parses notes into this one as well. I want to show you this because this turned out to be pretty important in our field study. Um, the, the way that the system knows how to translate the um, writing patterns into edges uh, is through a grammar that is user customizable that essentially says, when I write something like this, which is on the left, I want you to save it and recognize it that this is a particular relationship, right? If the evidence is indented under a claim and has the word supported by there, then there's a relationship supports between them. On the right here is a uh, essentially a data lock query pattern that uh, that's, that creates the mapping. And uh, users can actually extend this and create patterns of their own, create nodes of their own. This turned out to be really useful. So some brief snapshots from the field study and then we'll close and uh, have a conversation. Uh, so right now we're about 100-ish or so uh, alpha testers. Um, we are sort of deploying in these different contexts in the Discord community of academic Rome users and note-taking courses, experimental journal club. Um, just to give you some snapshots, right? So obviously I'm actively using this pretty actively in my lab, finding it very helpful for my own thinking. My students are finding it helpful. Um, it's useful for our, our, our discussions, right? And this kind of gives you a flavor also of the, um, you know, this is an outline for a paper that I'm writing that integrates these claims and evidence and helps me structure my thinking. And on the right here, you can see the context being easily available. Um, there's another uh, library information science research team is doing a systematic review that's using this to structure the thinking over evidence uh, to understand impacts of uh, you know, a culture of stress on mental health or physical health, for example. Um, We've done an experimental journal club working through a bunch of papers um, and structuring out the claims and questions and evidence that are in that knowledge base. Um, a microbiology lab is using it um, to kind of structure a project in lit review. Um, I'm not going to go through the details here because uh, I don't understand all of them, but essentially this is uh, kind of cell biology for a particular protein. And what we see here is that, you know, structuring a project in terms of questions and also uh, enabling you to then tie those questions to what, what are we thinking? What is the claims that we have in play? What evidence do we have so far? And then you can see at the bottom, uh, we have what looks like results and hypotheses that are also added, right, to, uh, to the project, right? And so this, this user actually extended the discourse graph grammar to also uh, enable thinking through conclusions and results that are um, primary um, primarily produced by the lab as opposed to from the literature. And they can all be part of the same conversation. So that whenever a new, new member joins the project, they also have the full context of past results, but also understand the chain of thinking. Um, an international lawyer used uh, this course graph to write uh, two books, is my understanding, uh, to really think carefully through a bunch of evidence. It was really helpful for structuring his thinking. And he also extended the grammar to uh, say distinguish between claims and conclusions, uh, for example, and uh, adding relationships like substantiates. Uh, for him, it was useful to distinguish between those, uh, that flavor of support. Um, we have a venture capital firm that's using this for road mapping that they're trying to tie discourse graph evidence to a discourse graph of uh, outcomes of constraints and solutions to understand opportunity areas. And so here again, we have to extend the grammar and we can, right? So you have constraints, relationships as opposed to support or oppose, for example. Um, more excitingly also, when, because it's out in the wild and it's open source, uh, people are starting to port this into other tools. So Tinderbox is another tool that's uh, one, of, one of the original hypertext notebooks and we had a user forum post uh, describing an implementation of this cross graph protocol in Tinderbox, uh, nothing to do with me. I just came across this like sort of by chance. Uh, you know, you can actually, Tinderbox has pretty powerful affordances for exploring a discourse graph that uh, Rome lacks and uh, you know, implementing this in there is pretty, pretty interesting. We have a grassroots funded bounty to port this uh, protocol to LockSeq, an uh, open source hypertext notebook. We also have some efforts to port this discourse graph uh, to an HTML annotation standard for broader web publishing use. So pretty excited about uh, what's been going on. 
uh, want to talk about some really uh, key initial insights from this uh, field study, right? Um, the first is that uh, I was mostly surprised that we didn't have to do anything that's super flashy to convince people to use it. Um, fostering more careful and creative thinking patterns was most of the time enough for people to adopt this. Uh, they, they want to think in this way and the tool helps them to think in this way and that's that's good. Um, and using it to find and access important ideas. Like later on, they can use the more advanced features, but uh, just simply having the discourse graph as a way to structure, right? That, that model as a way to structure the thinking was really useful. Also extending and personalizing grammar is crucial, right? Many extensions were finer distinctions, right? We have different flavors of claims or different flavors of evidence, uh, but you can all sort of be collapsed together if you wanted to sort of translate to a different graph. And uh, this connects to this uh, kind of concept of boundary objects from information science and CCW that enables coordination between different social worlds. Uh, we have this like weak structure and common use, very minimal ontology of questions, claims, and evidence, and you can extend it in local use uh, but enables you to sort of translate between those. This is, I think, a promising design pattern. Okay, so to summarize, uh, in Mercy's question two, I think we have a proof of concept that it's possible to write close to prose and create shareable discourse graphs as a byproduct. Uh, I think this opens up new paths to sustainable scholarly authoring. So I'm going to, uh, you know, now talk about some conclusions and we'll, we'll um, address some more questions, right? So where we want to go next is discuss graphs from or to everywhere, right? I think we've established sort of the uh, utility of the model. Um, we've established that there are integration points and I'm excited about the idea of this uh, being a synthesis protocol, um, you know, tools as clients on the open protocol, uh, integrating discourse graph extensions in Miro, Twitter, Slack, Hypothesis, and so on. Right. Uh, what about the spectrum? Like, right? um, how do we enable portability, transferability, interoperability, uh, in particular to avoid the, the one standard problem? Uh, we don't want to sort of like you know force everybody to use a single standard. And so, this idea of translating between uh, user extendable grammars, but also having a similar underlying idea, uh, seems like one promising way to enable this peer-to-peer -peer thing to start. People might be concerned about formality, machine readability. Uh, right now, we can see there's minimal formality in terms of like we don't have any ontologies in here, right? There's no like connections to uh, wiki data or OWL or anything like that. Um, but it could, in principle, if you wanted to, you could integrate that into the, the, the document itself, right? You can sort of have an OWL representation of the um, particular relationships that are spec'd out in a piece of evidence, for example. There's no technical reason that you can't do that. Uh, so I'm excited about this sort of middle layer between uh, the sort of more structured knowledge graph that's more granular and the more coarse uh, documents, this kind of middle layer of the discourse graph to enable sort of uh, communication across the systems. Um, I don't have much to say about this. Uh, maybe NLP would be useful for stitching things together um, because at some point we need to, some way to understand uh, which pieces of evidence are the same or similar, which pieces of claims are similar or not. Uh, ontologies probably won't be enough. And so that's something down the line. I think it's, it doesn't seem, uh, I've not worked on it yet, but that's like something, something for the future. Okay, so revisiting a larger vision, we have this building block for a new infrastructure beyond iTunes for papers. Um, and yeah, we start by just facilitating collaboration and then you can scale up by uh, prioritizing decentralization and federation. Um, and we can publish to say databases like Ceramic or The Graph or so on. And people can subscribe to Graph queries, you can start there. As opposed to every publishing to a single streaming, you can start to uh, have people talk to each other. I like this metaphor, uh, the way that we're working as opposed to starting from the top and saying, everybody's gonna do this. We start from the bottom and build tools for people to adopt and then we grow the infrastructure from the ground up. This is the kind of general strategy that we're excited about. Okay, so I'll close with a call to action for my friends, the uh, tool builders, HCI people. Uh, there's a lot of space for tool building and science reform. It's not just about the institutions or incentives or funding. It's also about what we do in our day-to-day, -day, the tools that we use. And so I'm hopeful that more of us work on this problem. Um, and, you know, not just make it required, but also make it easy to be able to, to bridge from uh, the bottom to the top. Okay, so I'll leave the slide up and we'll have a chat. Uh, you know, so this is hard. Our infrastructure pillars are wrong in analysis. 
discussed graphs can help, uh, but we do lack sustainable means of authoring. Uh, but I think we've got some promising directions with uh, tools for scholar power contributions. So thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat. Thanks, Joel, for as always a very interesting and thought provoking discussion. Join us again at our next research seminar. I believe it is 9 August. Taking a little bit of a break for the summer.